So thanks, David, uh, for the seminar. Thanks to the organizers of the program. It's uh, wonderful to be back at the INI after a couple of years. So I'm going to essentially, you know, keeping in line with the spirit of this program and the closest I can get there, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, essentially about active turbulence, and I'll tell you a little bit about what that is. And if time permits, and I can't help it, that's because I'm a high Reynolds number person, I'll try and sort of tell you a little bit about uh, some new ideas that, has, uh, that we've sort of been floating around. Uh, in high Reynolds number flows. And also, you know, as far as uh, active turbulence goes, you will really see it's a high Reynolds number person and the flow, it's a masquerading. Uh, yeah. All right, so here we go. So uh, in general, of course, you know, turbulence is sort of ubiquitous. Still, a few years ago, I thought that was confined to the world of high Reynolds number flows. And here's a nice video from Srini, Diego, and PK's uh, simulations, the really large simulations with someone very kindly put up on YouTube, uh, which shows what this flow looks like. But it turns out, and you know, I recently learned that low Reynolds number flows can also have a similar behavior when you sort of zoom out. So at high density, so this, for example, is a, since our interest began on, in this, this is a experiment from our experiments that we've set up. I won't talk about the experiments, but this is just to guide the visual process, uh, where, where you look at a suspension in this case of an equali dense E. coli suspension. And when you stare at these two figures, uh, movies, they seem to be somewhat similar in nature. So what we are trying to address today is to try and understand, is this really turbulence? What, it, what does it mean for this to be turbulent? And in particular, we will address issues of scaling, universality, and spottiness in case I get time uh, towards the end of my talk, but happy to discuss with you later about this in, in such flows. So let's begin. And, and to begin, we let, let's sort of look at the problem of, of, of active systems. So as a kind of obligatory, uh, active matter is ubiquitous. In the workshop about a couple of weeks ago, uh, some of these pictures in their various avatars showed up in Sri Ram Ray and Mike Stokes. So for us, you know, these are things which move in short, right? So in this talk, what we will look at is uh, our dense bacterial suspensions. In particular, you know, not that a lot of this will be thrown out as I start simplifying the problem, but the picture that I have in mind are either dense suspensions of Subtilis bacterium, and the reason why I mentioned Subtilis is because that's one of the papers from where we started our explorations. And also, you know, a bit about the E. coli bacterium, because those are the experiments that we are doing. So what was noticed, uh, you know, in, 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 in a bunch of papers, and, and sort of I'll keep going back to this work by uh, Julia Regolstein and others, uh, is that when you put them, when you take a very dense suspension of these guys, they seem to organize themselves into patterns, which sort of, and then you sort of take very nice visual images of this. And when you stare at it long enough, for those of us who have worked with high Reynolds number flows, they tend to look like what you might see in a soap film, in, in a high Reynolds number turbulence soap film experiment. And this sort of, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, and this sort of gave rise to this whole notion of active turbulence, uh, which essentially uh, deals with, you know, the dynamics of these low Reynolds number active systems. And at this point, they seem to remind us about the vertical chaotic uh, high Reynolds number fluid turbulent flows. So how should, how should one start worrying about these systems? So the microscopic approaches, a lot of this was discussed uh, two weeks ago, so I just for the sake of completeness, I should mention this. So, you know, the simplest approach would be to take a collection of rods or, you know, what, what have you, and you give them the right interaction rules, and then they start moving in nice and, in this case, colorful patterns, and, and you see the emergence of, of, of collective behavior. This, of course, you know, uh, for me, sort of, you know, it's, it's useful to think about this starting from, from the Vicksec model, 
and uh, which, which shows these very nice behavior. So interestingly, and I won't talk about this, but recently my students sort of adapted this zigzag model to micro swimmers in a real turbulent flow to show under what conditions flocking can naturally arise when you sort of beat, if you like, uh, the mixing due to turbulence and you get these wonderful uh, flocking patterns, even when these are suspended in a complex environment. So one can sort of make things more realistic and, and, and one can sort of have a very microscopic approach. But given, you know, what sort of is, is a more natural way to think about this problem for me is one can take a macroscopic approach as well. So this is again, another movie from these experiments that we are doing. And when you zoom out of it, uh, you know, you zoom out, then you sort of start to think of whether one can write down the dynamics of this fluid as it were. So exactly treating water as a fluid and forgetting about the H2O, uh, the discreteness of it all. Uh, and, and then one starts to write down essentially a coarse grained velocity field uh, for uh, these uh, evolution, uh, which have a Navier-Stokes like evolution. Uh, so those of you who are there for John's talk, he sort of went through this in some detail, essentially to understand, you know, where uh, what this sort of coarse grain dynamics looks like. Just as a reminder, there is the uh, there is of course the tuna two terms which contribute to uh, organized behavior, to flocking, etc. And then you have the swift Hoenberg terms which leads to uh, destabilizing mechanism. So what we will do is we will treat our bacterial suspension essentially as a continuum to dimensional fluid. And so this is what the real stuff will look like. This is what the fake stuff will look like, which is just going to be a solution of this sort of coarse grained approach. And essentially one can sort of, you know, with a lot of fudging, uh, try to relate uh, the, the injection or the activity term alpha, that, that is all that we will worry about, what happens when you change alpha, and one can sort of relate that to the typical uh, velocity scales in the problem. All right, so the first thing that one notices when one actually plays around with this equation is that as you increase activity, the pattern sort of changes. And this was not something new. I mean, the, the, so, so in this uh, paper of ours, we had sort of looked at this, but earlier as well, people looked at it and you'll find some familiar names who have looked at it, including John, who's sitting right there. All right. So what what's the question that someone like myself, who sort of never looked at things at low Reynolds number, never looked at things which are actually alive, uh, so to say, uh, sort of would like to ask. So what we wanted to ask a couple of years ago uh, was essentially, in what sense are these low Reynolds number flows turbulent? You know, there is a matter of, you know, we've when turbulence, we think about high Reynolds number system. So when you see something at low Reynolds number, a natural, perhaps a natural question for someone like me is to ask, what, what does it mean really when we say that this is turbulent? And the second part, which I don't think, uh, you know, I have the expertise all the time to address is given if there, given that there are these emergent complex flows, are they beneficial to the filial bacteria? So this, uh, uh, these questions were sort of addressed by my uh, group. So Shiddhattu was a postdoc. He's joining as a faculty at IIT Kanpur right now between his time in Bangalore and joining Kanpur. He's visiting a friend of ours, Dario Vincenzi, for a few months at, at, at Côte d'Azur. Uh, Rahul graduated and he's now a postdoc at Okinawa uh, with uh, Marco Rosti. And Martin James has also graduated and he's with Anieve Seminara at uh, University of Genoa. And so the references for, you know, the, the work that I'm going to summarize in this talk are, are listed here. All right. So what does it mean to be turbulent? So at the zeroth level, one of the sort of things that, that are driven into us in some sense is that A, in inertial turbulence, you have a certain universality of scale invariance. So you measure the energy spectrum, it doesn't matter really where you're measuring it, but for a homogeneous isotropic system, things are close to K minus five third. It could be from simulation of your Navier-Stokes equation, it could be the wind tunnel at Gettingen, it could be 
you know, measurements up there uh, in the atmosphere. And the second thing that, again, is sort of driven into us is that high Reynolds flows are intermittent. And naively, what that means is that you have large tails in velocity uh, gradients, in velocity increments, in acceleration, and a bunch of measurements that you can make in high Reynolds number flows. So is our bacterial suspension, at least with these two as ad hoc litmus tests, are they turbulent? Do they show any of these characteristics? It turns out that perhaps not. So uh, the energy spectra calculations, which are very nice calculations by uh, Erwin Fry, Rafinov, and Yenko a few years ago, showed that as you change, so this is exactly what is measured in high Reynolds number flow, the energy spectrum. I'll define it in a bit for, I, I think all of you are familiar with what the energy spectrum is, but I'll define it for my calculations in a bit. What they show is that the scaling sort of varies as you change the activity. So that's very different from what we know in high Reynolds number turbulence. The range of scaling might change with and does change with the Reynolds number you have, but given that there is a scaling range, uh, good old Kolmogorov with corrections uh, is uh, always seen. And what about uh, intermittency? So this goes back to the earlier paper by Wensing et al. They, they measured gradients in a bunch of, uh, you know, the, the sort of self-propelled rod model in their experiments and their continuum theory, which is the one that I'm uh, dealing with. They found things to be Gaussian. So no sign of intermittency, no sign of a universality in the scale invariance. So what we find here, and that's really the punchline, and this is from uh, this work last year, and, and I'll go through this slowly in small steps, the details I can discuss with you uh, after the talk, is that an approximate scale invariance really emerges in these systems when pushed beyond the critical activity. So let's, let, let's see what we mean by that and, and how does one actually begin to construct theory for that. So this is the definition of the energy spectrum. So that's just UK, UK. And, and, and this has a scaling exponent, K to the power delta. I Reynolds, to remind you once again, delta is minus five third. Uh, Bratton of Yen Confray showed that delta for these systems is a function of alpha and not really universal. So what we do is essentially rather simple, uh, uh, you know, things that have been done for years in, in closure theory in, in, in navier Stokes, if we sort of adopt a closure approach to work with this equation, right? And so what one can do is using a quasi-normal approximation, closing the higher moments, uh, essentially, uh, I'll, I'll come to the catch line, otherwise I'll sort of lose my audience, essentially, I can define an effective time scale in the problem, k to the power xi, and I'll tell you what that time scale might mean, and use all of that to construct the energy flux, which is the amount of energy going across a wave number k. And one can sort of put all of this in. It's sort of doable, not too difficult algebra. And one makes the following assumption, and that at very low activity, and this was the Bratinov uh, regime, that at very low activity, this time scale is essentially constant. Just to remind you, in the Kolmogorov world, this would be k minus two third. Here, it's essentially constant, and you can sort of cross-check self-consistency from numerics. And so xi becomes zero, you plug all of that in, and then lo and behold, you get an energy spectrum with an exponent which depends on alpha. Very good, nothing universal, right? So you have essentially an activity dependent scaling with strong lack of universality. So this I've taken from the uh, work of uh, Bratinov et al, where they calculate the star effective and the range that we are interested in where the scaling we are trying to work out, you end up with a tau effective, which is constant and flat, yes. Yeah. So the um, the e total term that you get, I guess it comes from the e square that you multiply with. Yeah. So how does it become e total? So uh, you get the e total by, you know, I'm just trying to remember how I can show it from here. 
but you get the e, the, the e total comes out through an integral which you have to write down. Maybe I can do it on the blackboard. That will be quick, and then I'll remember the steps. Okay, <laughs> but it, 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 it's nothing very significant in the way it appears. Okay, all right. So the question is, how low is low? Because the claim is that at low activity this happens. I'll give the sort of game away uh, by saying the following. So as you notice from this equation, as as the system becomes more and more active delta becomes shallower, the scaling exponent of the energy spectrum. So claim is that as delta goes to zero, the small wave number modes or the large scales are starting to become energetic. Delta being large and positive, you have a steep spectra, the small, uh, the small wave numbers hardly have any energy. Now, as this happens, you are nicely and and this happens you know it's just setting this take this guy to going to zero and you get the value of alpha critical for a given set of parameters and you end up with a number which is order minus five and then this assumption of a constant effective time scale breaks down and you can then use the standard sort of bootstrapping that one does in closure theory that's not uncommon to uh, many of us you end up just to you know looking at the time so you end up essentially showing that this effective time scale has a scaling so this is at low activity once you cross a, i'm hesitant to use the word critical but let's say a crossover alpha c i'll tell you why i'm hesitant to use the word critical of course uh, th that you end up with a scaling behavior which is k minus seven eight you can bootstrap you can sort of put all of that in and you see that at activities beyond this alpha C, the energy spectrum from such a closure calculation turns out to be K minus three halves. So the alpha dependence has disappeared. We are safely in the world of Kolmogorov where we have a spectral scaling, which is constant and not dependent on activity. So does this actually sort of, you know, match up to 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 uh, to measurements from simulations. So here's a plot of delta as a function of activity. So you see, till minus five, there's a smooth behavior. Smooth. There is a, a change with respect to alpha, and then at around minus five, you stick to the minus three halves exponent. So you so there is a reasonably clear sort of numerical signature of this transition that we are talking about. There is something embarrassing here which is theoretically we predicted alpha c to be minus 10. Numerically, we find it minus five. We looked for a missing factor of half in our calculations, we never found it. So probably some of those you know, constants that I buried as order one must be playing some sort of a role. All right, so what about, uh, what about uh, critical activity? Uh, you know, what happens to these to this idea of an emergent intermittency in the problem? But so remember, this was you know the earlier findings when the bacterial flows were not massively energetic, not massively uh, uh, active, and and they found you know very little evidence, and they stated very clearly in their work that everything is nice and Gaussian, and there are no fat tails. So what we do is, and, and this is sort of a schematic of how one can think about intermittency for, uh, you know, someone, uh, if someone hasn't looked at it. So what are we looking at? So the top panel is from uh, simulations where alpha is below the critical activity, what, and, and the lower panel is beyond the critical activity. What one finds is, so I take my vorticity field and I filter it, you know, showing only things beyond twice omega RMS, four times omega RMS, six times omega RMS. You quickly see that when things are low, so corresponding to this sort of system, visually you see that there is not much to see for large values of omega. However, for things when you cross the alpha C uh, sort of transition, you see that you still continue to see specs of, of, of omega floating around. So that's sort of, you know, a, a sort of, smell test of whether your flow is intermittent or not. One, we, we sort of quanti you know, quantified this as best as one could by measuring the PDFs of delta V. You see the nice old Gaussian of Wensing et al. But once we move beyond 
uh, you start to see factors, and this can be quantified in various ways, like the kurtosis, et cetera. So for example, this is the kurtosis. So three is when things are Gaussian. Again, you see it picks up the alpha minus five uh, transition there. If that's for a fixed beta and a for a fixed lambda. You know, so that, that is very cool. mildly because you know we are constrained in, in our beta. Yes. Very mildly. All right. So finally, just to sort of you know look at one further aspect of these systems. Um, and, and the interest really comes from uh, other many body systems that we've been looking at recently. Uh, in the Heisenberg spin chain and in thermal fluids where, you know, uh, for those of you who would uh, might be interested, so these are generalizations of the quantum OTOCs to measure quantum chaos, which we sort of developed for classical many body systems in the last few years. Uh, what we wanted to use, and when you develop a new tool, you want to play with it a little. So we wanted to, I mean, in all honesty, so, so we wanted to play a little with this tool for understanding uh, what happens to these, to the nature of chaos in, in these systems. So, uh, so the prescription that we introduced in these papers essentially is the following. We take a steady state uh, field of our uh, suspension, we make a copy of it, and we introduce in the copy, we introduce an infinitesimal change, let's say at the center. So, so so, and, and then, you know, we have system A and system B at T equal to zero. We make a tiny little perturbation, let's say at the origin. And now we are going to let A and B evolve independently. And we are going to measure point-wise, what's the difference in these two fields. So this, as you can, you know, if you sort of, you know, if you have some interest in the way the OTOCs were developed for quantum field theory in terms of commutators. This can be rigorously shown to be the Poisson bracket uh, analog of, of, of these uh, out of time uh, commutators. And so we can sort of see the, so this is the evolution of delta omega and delta u. So at t equal to zero. So again, top panel, mild activity, bottom panel, high activity. So at t equal to zero, they're sort of localized in a tiny little bit everywhere else at zero because the two fields are identical and you want to see how they spread. So this is roughly, it's a very slow and painful uh, animation which sort of shows how these perturbations spread in such systems. But what one can actually then measure and I'd sort of just focus, uh, so, so phi is the decorrelator, so you see as a function of time, the decorrelator defined here has an exponential growth, and then it saturates because of the nonlinearity, which you can sort of see, uh, show from the equations, and you can measure the slope to get the Lyapunov exponent in this problem. The rather interesting thing that we found, I mean, if you consider the noisy behavior here to be credible, of course, is that the Lyapunov exponent sort of, so this is alpha, the Lyapunov exponent grows, so as the system becomes more, uh, more active, it becomes more and more chaotic, till it saturates at the, around the critical alpha C that we mentioned. So this is something very strange because normally, you know, for high Reynolds turbulence people, you can use your favorite sort of theory. You know that the Lyapunov exponent, let's say for high Reynolds number, is grows as Reynolds to the power half modulo I mean, half is debatable, but Reynolds to the past something which looks close to half. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, but it's certainly not something that you see here. What you end up seeing are actually maximally chaotic states, which then saturate. It really doesn't matter if you've given your poor bacteria more food or more oxygen and made them more excitable. It, 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 it remains in that state of chaos. So very good. So beyond this critical activity, what does it what does it imply for mixing, right? So the question is sort of motivated by several experiments that we had seen, which had looked at the motion of tag particles or traces in these sort of dense suspensions. So what we do here is, you know, do a theorist experiment, a controlled experiment. So what we do is we now feed our flow with 
you know, with several Lagrangian trajectories, and we are going to try and understand whether these individual trajectories pick up this transition, and, and in what way do they pick up this transition. So as a visual illustration, so for example, here you see a bunch of trajectories. They're color-coded with different alpha. So you see, if you go, I mean, you probably don't really see it, but but here, for example, things are really meandering and naughty. So it's it's really like a diffusive system. But when you cross the threshold of minus five, so here we you know separate out trajectories, there are enough trajectories which seem to go in straight lines, and there are enough which are diffusive, which you don't see when 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 you haven't fed your bacteria with enough light or sugar. Uh, and, and they're sort of related to the geometry. So I'll just show you one aspect of this. And you know, uh, if you want in the reference down here, you can you can uh, sort of look at it more carefully. What we look at, what it implies for mean squared displacement is just the following. So we measure the mean squared displacement, which of course is ballistic at short times and T xi long time, where xi as you know can be diffusive, super diffusive, sub diffusive, depending on what you get. So what we find, uh, I'm sorry, the references are not showing up here, but what we find, and not surprising, I mean, there have been several experimental work sort of hidden somewhere there, uh, where, where people sort of observed that in these systems, there is a natural T squared to T transition. So it's a ballistic followed by a diffusive transition. However, when we, and this is what we find, however, when we crank up, and cross this threshold of minus five, we end up getting an extremely robust super diffusive regime. We get a T to the power four third. It scales animalistically. And, uh, you know, uh, and, and what's interesting is we found at least one set of experiments, and this is the work by Gil Ariel and others, where they're actually sort of exactly for the system that we are sort of hydrodynamics is based on. Where, where, where they sort of reported the super diffusive behavior in, in, in such suspensions. So then uh, we are able to sort of, you know, tie this all up. I mean, uh, again, I'll be happy to sort of discuss these in length with you. Tie this all up to the levy statistics. So essentially bootstrap ourselves by looking at the usual waiting time and the turning distance statistics to see that essentially the levy constraint is satisfied from the independent measurements that we make of the mean squared displacement of the trajectories, how they turn and, and, and setting all sorts of thresholds. All right, so this, you know, just to summarize, and I'm in good time, uh, just to summarize what we sort of, uh, what we saw, and, and this to me was the most striking bit of this is, at least in the hydrodynamic model that we are looking at, I should be careful. Uh, in the hydrodynamic model that we are looking at, we find that there is a transition to a universal state beyond a crossover activity, where A, there is a universal scaling exponent. So that's good. That's like Kolmogorov. B, that this transition or this emergent sort of reorganization of the flow allows for super diffusive behavior in these suspensions that ought to be good. I'm sort of here, I'm speculating that I presume that ought to be good for the poor bacterium who might want to travel some distances using levy or whatever to, 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 to get to where the source of food is. But for me, uh, you know, and, and this will sort of will give a nice segue to the analogous problem in 3D high and all turbulence. So I'm just making the transition here. This, for me, very interestingly, that this crossover scale also leads to the strongly intermittent behavior in these suspensions. So why is, you know, uh, as the title of my talk was, you know, we are sort of confronting the worlds of low Reynolds and high Reynolds number together and trying to understand what's unique to high Reynolds number turbulence, which, you know, which, which sets it apart. So let's sort of look at this. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, 
you, you seem to have as an, uh, as an older parameter this activity. So beyond a certain activity, you find universality. But surely you would expect that concentration of those bacteria must play a role, right? Yes. Because that would directly translate back into uh, this property, and so they know when. Right. But here, this is being worked in the regime where we are assuming that the density is, the concentration is very large. There are no large number fluctuations, there are no density fluctuations, it's incompressible, etc. So it's really in a very kind of, you know, fakeish regime where it's always in high concentration. Yes. So, so which is why I sort of ended by being a little careful and said the, these are certainly the features of the equations. Now, to what extent the equations mimic even real high concentration flows. Um, so we can discuss that uh, towards the end of the talk, but it's not something that I'm, you know, I'm going to stick my neck out. All right. So this, yeah. So, so this issue of intermittency is something which is sort of very dear to at least many of us in this room. Uh, in, in terms of what we've sort of known and appreciated in high Reynolds number flows. So I'm going to pick, pick this point up and I'm now going to make a little transition to what is the, you know, what does this mean when you come to real high Reynolds number turbulence? And this is some sort of, you know, ideas that we've sort of recently been trying to develop. And it would be nice, you know, if, if, the, if uh, just to share with you guys while you're sort of building up some of these ideas. I'll just tell you what we know for a fact to happen. And the speculation, I'll do it offline, all right? Since, uh, uh, since, since there, I'm on less firm territory. All right. So we looked at bacterial turbulence, you know, Toner 2, Swift, Hoenberg equations. So now let's go into the more comfortable world for me, which is fully developed high Reynolds number inertial turbulence. And let's pick up on that intermittency idea and see what, 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 what it means there. So these are, of course, you know, examples of uh, non-equilibrium systems, which are driven dissipative and uh, in, in, in non-equilibrium stationary states. I already sort of discussed a little bit the telltale signatures a minute ago, uh, a few minutes ago, when I tried to say what is the litmus test I want. I wanted to test active turbulence too. So just to remind us, they are chaotic, they're irreversible, not surprising, you have viscosity, they're intermittent, and there are multiple length and time scales in the problem. All right, the last bit is perhaps a bit mystic right now, and, and we'll leave it at that for the moment. Uh, all right, so one of the key characteristics of fully developed turbulence is its essential spottiness. And I had sort of, you know, I'd known this work, but, but, but recently, you know, thanks to someone anonymous, sort of this was reminded that this, this is, and, and, and I found it a beautiful thing. So, you know, if you go back to the early works of Bachelor and Townsend in this very town, uh, what, they sh what they showed was, and this is a snapshot from their experiments, looking at higher and higher gradients, what they found was that the flow signals were spotty. There were patches where there were high frequency, uh, I'm using the word noise as a, as, a, as, as, as a, you know, not to be taken literally, but just to get the picture across. There were high frequency oscillations, which could be localized in space. And, and, and then, you know, while I was going through uh, this anonymous uh, Good Samaritan, I sort of, we, we dug deep and we found that there were a lot of interesting work going on, you know, well before ideas of fractals and multifractals came into being, which were on boundary layer uh, experiments, some of them in Bangalore, as it happens by uh, Satish Tawan and Ruddam Nasima, where they sort of all, uh, you know, reported these, this essential spotty character of uh, high Reynolds number turbulence. There's also very nice work, since John's here, just to highlight, also very nice work by Gibbon and Deering, where there's a bit in that calculation which sort of cement some of these ideas rather nicely, or they claim to. So the essential spottiness of turbulence shows up in many ways. One of the, and, and this is really going to be, a, for the next minute, will be 
slightly evangelist in the sense that I'm going to advocate for, <laughs> for the beauty of intermittency or importance of it. Uh, uh, you know, it shows up when you measure essentially exponents of correlation functions of velocity differences. So, and, and then, you know, this sort of uh, remarkable idea of Frisch and uh, Parisi many years ago who have tried to explain why you don't have simple scaling in such problems. I mean, Colin McGraw gives you really simple scaling. It also, so what the evangelist part is, that this is just not a matter of theorists and analysts and, you know, just to understand some basic question. But, you know, many of us, and this is just self-advertisement, of course, but many of us have seen that even in applied problems, for example, the rate at which cloud droplets grow through coalescence, whether the carrier flow is turbulent or not matters. Turbulence can speed up the rate of growth. So essentially the effective kernels in your effective mean field Smolachowski equations are enhanced because of turbulent intermittency, exactly this feature. It, it matters in the days of global warming. Uh, you know, the effective orientation of crystals, which ice crystals in, let's say, cirrus clouds, which sort of tells, controls a little bit of, you know, of, of warming and, and weather patterns. So being spotty matters is, is, all I'm, is all I'm advocating. But at a more generic, you know, at, at a more global level, of course, these are issues which ties up whatever this vague phrase is, the turbulence question, there are people, you know, who might like to believe that, you know, there is this sort of circle of evil and you would try to sort of crack each of these and then probably answer whatever this big uh, question is. So what we do is, and, and just, you know, I'll just lay out this prescription. What we've done recently is uh, to do what people have done before. I mean, it's not something new in terms of the approach, but... You take a look, I mean, the spottiness, for example, this is a trace of essentially the dissipation field epsilon. And what you do have are these sort of, you know, intermittent spikes and Poisson behavior. So this goes back many decades ago to the work of uh, Srini and, and, and Charles. And what, and, and what sort of one way to rationalize it, not really a theory as such, is to have a multifactorial description of this field. Right. So what, what one does is essentially the following idea. One sort of looks at the three-dimensional embedding. And so you sort of say that the dissipation field itself, if you can visualize, is sort of interwoven in fractal sets, each with a different scaling alpha. I mean, this is a standard prescription which emerged in the 80s and 90s and essentially which sort of relates uh, to, 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 to the Hilder exponent. So the question is, how does one compute these exponents and the associated fractal dimensions? So this is a sort of, you know, just a two slide summary in case someone sort of here is interested in actually computing these. So essentially one can, so this is some epsilon field from our simulations. One essentially takes this field and divides it up into little boxes of different sizes, R1, R2, R3, et cetera, constructs the standard partition function. This is all well known. And you pick up the, general, the generalized dimension dq corresponding to the qth moment of what's contained in these little balls. And when you do that, then from there, it's, you can, and, and, and you know, I, I'm just flashing this amongst the many papers here because I'm just following the notation of Menevo and Srinivasan, just in case, you know, you want to reproduce this, not to confuse people. And then from here, you can reconstruct the f of alpha corresponding to the scaling exponent alpha there. And, and, and you get what is in common parlance known as the singularity spectrum. All right. So within the Kolmograph picture, what you end up having is the one dimension. So dq is... Let's say it's a three-dimensional, so it's just your spatial dimension equal to three, uh, alpha one, h one third, et cetera, et cetera. And so all of this makes sense if you're doing Kolmogorov. What happens in reality is, so here's a section of the dissipation field epsilon from our uh, simulations. What happens is if you actually, 
compute these guys, you get a very broad distribution of exponents, right? I mean, I knew it's just, you know, this is all that was done in the early 90s. And, and so unlike Kolmogorov, which would tell you just a little spike at alpha equal to one, what you have is a broad distribution of these exponents and the corresponding f alpha. So here it's two because this is being constructed in a, on a two-dimensional slice. So what we want to sort of focus on is that this procedure is in a sense global. You take the full dissipation field and you construct your, your interpretation of the dissipation field and all the exponents that go into it in a global sense. So what we, and, and sort of, you know, there are, and, and this we can discuss after the talk, and there are certain issues which relate to the ideas of cascade, et cetera, in, 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 in this story. So the sort of naive question that we asked, and, you know, and, and there's some sort of, you know, interesting sort of ways to look at it. And some of the references are here, some are hidden in the black hole below, is that could there be an inhomogeneous distribution of these exponents in the flow itself? Or in other words, you know, uh, for example, let's take a toy problem, a multiplicative cascade model. So by hand, we can construct something which is strictly monofactorial that gives you just this sort of delta peak at alpha one. We can construct something strictly multifactorial, which gives you this nice blue tactile thing, which all of us know. Or you can construct something by hand, which is a mixture of the two. It turns out, you know, and, and you can, you know, there are some other toy models that we can talk about later. It turns out that even for the mixed case, the standard way of looking at this problem essentially cannot pick up the fact that there are regions where things are essentially nice, well-behaved, and not violent. So what we wanted to ask in a nutshell is, could we, you know, the first half, I have nothing to say on that. I don't even know why I have, I have it up there. But the second two lines are something that we are able to sort of construct. Can we sort of calculate the generalized dimensions now as a function of x or the scaling exponent alpha as functions of x? So, I mean, trivially, you can think that alpha is free agent. So, you know, when, when you do one, your. Uh, so, since I'm running out of time, maybe I'll come back to these ideas after the talk. Why this might be, you know, it's just a speculative in some sense, but why these might lead to interesting ideas in actually figuring out if there are sort of, you know, possible singular hotspots in a flow and these animals kind of live in some sort of blended isolation. All right. So more uh, generously, uh, the question that one can ask now is whether the turbulent flow is uniformly multifactorial. A question that is hard to answer if you do, if you play the game in the standard way that it has been played. So again, in the first half, you saw this gentleman, so I, I won't repeat it, uh, his sort of, you know, pretend, uh, his sort of, you know, where he's in, what he's doing. So this is Sugan, uh, who was my PhD student. He's now a postdoc with Greg Ein at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and Ritik is a starting, uh, you know, he's just started his PhD. He essentially works more on blast problems and fractional of these stokes. I had asked the same question to my students and they refused to answer. They really obviously care about how they are photographed. I'm like their advisor. <laughs> exactly the question I had of them, especially these two. All right. <laughs> oh, this is all recorded and online. <laughs> okay. I'm sure they won't see this. <laughs> all right. So what we do is essentially the following perverse game. We take the dissipation field and we tile it, or it's not really coarse graining in the sense of statistical physics. So what we do is we essentially tile this dissipation field in these little boxes. I'm showing a 2D cut because it's kind of easier to visualize. I can play with the size of these boxes, they're non-overlapping boxes, just to see if things converge. 
I have to worry about the minimum resolution, you know, I have to worry about how small I make these boxes because that determines how well I can measure the scaling of the partition function. You need just about enough points, if you remember the old prescription that I showed a few minutes ago, to actually calculate things locally everywhere. All right? So this is not really at x, but it's in the neighborhood of x. But hopefully the neighborhood is small enough for us to say something about what's going on in, 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 in the field. All right, so this is just sort of sanity checks about how good, uh, you know, in terms of the Pearson coefficient, et cetera, how, how confident are we in making the measurement of these partition functions? So since, you know, it's getting late, so let me just sort of quickly tell you what we are, uh, what we find. So for example, if you look at the correlation dimension D2, with this prescription, you suddenly see that there is a rather rich, uh, you know, underlying feature in the way D2 is. I mean, something, of course, all of this is modular, the prescription being correct. And, you know, numerically, we think it's correct. I mean, we've, we've done all the usual sanity checks for this. Uh, so what you, what you immediately see is that there is strong local variations in the way the, uh, for example, the D2 exponent looks like. And so, for example, just to give you a full picture of it, so these are, uh, you know, let's, for lack of time, let's just concentrate on the left, uh, the right side, which is the singularity spectrum. These are taken randomly from different tiles that you saw, right? So you immediately see that the shape, of course, not surprising is somewhat similar, but you immediately see that the width of these uh, of the singularity spectrum does seem to change from location to location, which is what you know one was after. And so, what in a in a in a reasonably ad hoc way, what we do is we sort of calculate we go to each tile and calculate the width of this spectrum. I mean, I was about to say distribution; it's not a distribution it's a spectrum. Uh, one can calculate the width in each of these styles from measurements in each of these styles. And then one argues uh, from the standard deviation of this, then one argues that if it's zero or going to zero, that's in the monofractal limit. If it goes order one, that's in the multifractal limit. Just to remind you, you can sort of bootstrap yourself with this kind of argument to get back the column, you know, to, to tell us what it means for the kolmogorov picture. All right. so. I, yeah, I'm nearly at the end. So, uh, so, so now if I look at, you know, I'm just showing a 2D slice for ease of visualization. If you look at a snapshot of pi in, at a given time, you see the strong variation. Yellow patches correspond to stuff when phi is close to zero. So that's the classical Kolmogorov result. And red, I mean, you can actually calculate some sort of an upper bound in terms of order of magnitude of phi. Uh, the darkest patches correspond to regions where things are strongly multifactored. Right? So what, you know, just to check if at least operationally, if this is self-consistent, we looked at from uh, PK's data of whatever it is, 16,000 cube or whatever, down to 512 cube and uh, resolutions in between that some in Bangalore and some from other people's data uh, available, we see this sort of very strong variation in phi. And what we would like to, you know, eventually, if this idea is correct, and there are things which, you know, which we can discuss, then what one would like to uh, construct are two point functions just to see whether there are regions which in time can change from being very singular to not. All right. What was quite uh, interesting is, and here again, you know, following especially the work of uh, Guido, Andrea, and Angelo, one can sort of look at the mean phi here and measure it versus the local variation in epsilon, the local fluctuation and dissipation in each of these styles. And one sees a rather good agreement with a long, uh, long behavior. And so, uh, and that's exactly what one might get, you know, with the right approximations from the Kolmogorov 1962 theory. And so it is, you know, I have a question mark here because we aren't 
absolutely sure, theoretically, numerically, and with the hand-waving arguments, we are sure, that locally, the column McGraw 62 theory seems to be maybe not very surprising, but that seems to be sort of uh, uh, entirely valid. So the basic message that we sort of are uh, coming up with, and, and this is something that probably many of us may have felt anyway, is that uh, the turbulence is essentially this huge column number of C where everything works for columns, but you have these sort of really important islands of, of, of essential multifactorial behavior. So just to end where, where it all began, so in the first half, we talked about the active classical turbulence correspondence. And just to remind you that in the in such bacterial suspensions that we had looked at, we found uh, an emergent universality in the scale invariance. So that active low Reynolds number turbulence starts to smell and feel like high Reynolds number turbulence. And, and that's accompanied by the onset of intermittency and maximally chaotic states. And uh, you know the references are there if you want uh, more details. And in the high Reynolds number business, we sort of you know developing this prescription. So I sort of couldn't ignore the chance to share this, especially with some people in the audience who sort of been helmed this field in its early days, as it were. Uh, to find that there are local variations in multifractality, there are patches, whether this suggests that you have patches of singular behavior, we, we are working on. So I would sort of kind of end with where I began with the two images that we have and say that, you know, just coming from the high inertial, you know, inertial high Reynolds number fluid turbulence, uh, I sort of, we discussed what I mean by active turbulence being really like fluid turbulence, but not entirely sure because of all the, you know, things that we discussed along the way. Okay, thank you very much. It's, it's, I'm sorry it, it went on a little longer than I would have liked to. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, if you have questions, you can ask them in the um, yeah. yeah. On, on the last part, have you played the game of 2D versus 3D and looked at uh, singularity and dissipation as conjectured by maybe Hansiger? And do you have something to say there about that? So, in, in we are actually started, so it's discussing with uh, Massimo just before the talk. We have started to set up something in 2D, not what you're suggesting, not on the on side of the 3D thing, which is here. But we know that 2D inverse cascade is very nice. It's very nice in the sense that it's sort of you know it's non-intermittent, etc. So we have we have started setting up something where we are playing this game in the inverse cascade, which is the opposite game, where we know that globally things are nice and non-intermittent, but just to pick up if there are some you know, multifactorial patches in the inverse cascade. But what we are really sort of, you know, trying to nail down is, is there a theoretical way? Numerically, you know, one can play the game and you can add these little pieces up. But theoretically for self-consistency, one would hope that the contributions, you know, the different spectrum that you get at different tiles, there might be a way to add them up to get the global distribution. Right? What is the correct weight that one needs to play with? So for that, we are sort of looking at more synthetic models, so where we can, you know, control what we are doing before moving into turbulence. So two D, yes, in the inverse cascade, we started looking, but before that, I think more urgently, what we want to do is to see that this is self-consistent in the sense that if I add up the little patches, you know, the contributions from each of these styles, I can build up the global statistics. In, in, in a certain system. Okay. So, um, did you look at how your result that it's locally, or locally it becomes an intermittent is very interesting? It is true. Yes, it's true. Yes. Uh, 
scale with uh, the box size? Like if you change yes, yes, yes. So, so we, uh, I don't think I put up the numbers. So, yes. Yeah, no, so I mean, essentially, what we wanted to do was to see if the idea is sensitive to the tile that we select, right? So, well, when you mean box size, you mean Reynolds number? So, yeah, so, so those boxes we have changed, played with. No, we didn't. No, no, okay, okay. No, no. You mean whether phi is scaling with boxes or not? No. I mean, the variation in this, so what we didn't do, that's a good point. So what we didn't do was take the box to be very large. So, you know, just to see what we did was change the box, you know, from whatever, from here to triple it or something, just to see that the picture that you had doesn't distort massively beyond it being more grainy because you're looking at larger boxes. Because you're saying scaling, sort of uh, not self-similar. If it was self-similar, no, I, I assume that you get the same. Yeah, no, I no, 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 no. I mean, no, it's, it's multifactor. So, so if you zoom but out. No, I understand, but that, but but if I peg it with the multifactor idea, if you're starting to zoom out, it will not be, you know, it will not be scale invariant in the way that you're suggesting. It will be multifactor. Uh, I, we can talk to, to, to talk about this. Yes. <laughs> Neither have I. <laughs> so, so I, I just uh, you mentioned flocking at the beginning. Yes. Is there any kind of a interaction between the, the agents that you so the, the sort of introductory flocking pictures I was showing? Uh, yeah, so I think most of them, the ones that I showed were with VicSec or variations of the VicSec uh, interactions. It was just to, oh God, <laughs> it was just to set the stage for, uh, yeah, you mean these, right? This, for example. Yeah, so this is, some sort of a modified VIX. I mean, at zero level, it's fixed. Right? Yeah. So you you have uh, you you decide how myopic your agents are, so how far they can see, and then you. I mean, here uh, this was just an example. Uh, so essentially, it's a, sort of this sort of behavior, and then you. I mean, so what we found interesting was you know how you can. There's a competition between what Tail Blooms is doing to break up flocks with what. So, what's the optimal size, if you like, of 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 our micro swimmers, which will allow them to flock in in in, in an adverse environment? I have a question. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, okay, that's good. You got that equation up there. Yeah. That one you keep saying that's a low Reynolds number. Yeah. Where did the Reynolds number go in? Why is why is that low Reynolds number? Because of the scales that are involved and the values of the man, the speeds that are involved. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. I understand why the real things right. low Reynolds. Mm -hmm. Small things. Go yeah, sure. Then you solve that equation. Yes. And you say, ah, oh, this is low end. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I understand. So here at the closure level where it sort of entails, but that's true for everywhere, is the fact that you have really non-energetic large scales, right? Sorry, did I get your question right? Are you talking about uh, the, sorry? Well, exactly. Which looks like inertia. Which looks like inertia, yeah, right. So what? There's a quasi Reynolds number which you can calculate with the parameters that go into the problem, and that turns out to be very small. You that equation, not knowing where it come from or what you were modeling. Yeah. I mean, if we had Navier Stokes, then yeah. So you can calculate. Big, but what is what is your right? So you can again use this lambda, right? With this inertial term or the nonlinear term, and you can then try to sort of look at this object here, right? To balance, like you would get if you were doing Reynolds number for Navier-Stokes, right? The ratio of the dissipative and the 
And so when you calculate it with the coefficients which go into these games, then you find out that that's a very small number. And that was a small number. In that's a small number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So that's 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 always constrained to be a small number. Yeah. yeah. The lambda. Well, we had a discussion on lambda <laughs> it, before. Which still yes. me actually, but <laughs> I mean that. <laughs> Which is the lambda is essentially coming out from the divergence of the rate of string tensor, and then you can put in. Yeah. But the the sort of classical way to compute the Reynolds number still turns out to be small, even in this model with all. But then it's surprising because if you can take the Navier Stokes equation, yeah, you would take the Navier Stokes equation and make the you know Reynolds number um, small so that inertia didn't come in. You wouldn't get. But there are no unstable modes. So this this comes with the wrong sign, right? Yeah, yeah. At the leading yeah. order. So especially a different non-linearity. Yeah. yeah. So it, this well, it yeah. this comes. So if you let, let's say you can play the following game, right? You can suppress you can suppress these two terms here, mm -hmm. and you're in the regime of tuna two, right? So what you have is essentially some source forming behavior with alpha negative, no friction. Now I'm turning on these pattern forming terms. This guy comes with a negative sign. So gamma zero is, so that's not Navier Stokes is all I mean. And, yeah, and, and so you can do a stability analysis of this and sort of see the unstable modes, which are high wave number. And so you see how this gets kicked into, uh, 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 into a non-Stokesian flow, if you like, into a chaotic regime. So how important is the U dot grand U term? It's important what we what what is what this was at least numerically not so sensitive on was the choice of lambda. We just stuck to the lambda that you know people have used in the past, uh, but we varied lambda a little bit, and we didn't find a great uh, dependence on lambda in the qualitative features of the flow, which was quite surprising. I mean, this was a point I think that Sriram was trying to make about lambda being you know things. Maybe it was during John's talk, right? About the role of lambda. Yeah, oh, I see. <laughs> right, right. About the role of lambda. So in our case, it was just a numerical check, which, which showed that lambda was not that sensitive. Okay. So I have yes, a, my... a question which kind of concerns both halves of the talk mm -hmm. and uh, a comment on the second part. The question is, uh, when you think of your kind of list of criteria by which you decide whether something mm. deserves to be called turbulent, which is obviously somewhat subjective. Bias. Viewpoint. Total bias. But, um, viewpoint. Well, I'm not sure. Um, so the, one thing that you might say is there has to be some kind of cascade or inverse cascade, but some some kind of conserved quantity, which is uh, you know connecting different length scales in a particular way. And the reason I mention that is because, of course, the third kind of quote, turbulence, which is elastic turbulence, uh, doesn't have a cascade. Yeah. If you look at the, uh, 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 the, 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 the viscoelastic fluid, it's not the Reynolds term that matters, it's the viscoelastic nonlinearity. But what that's doing is it's basically scattering energy from all wave vectors into all other wave vectors. Yeah. So it's a complete mess, actually. And it may be you can go in there and you can see some kind of spectrum, but it doesn't have anything like the same, uh, you know, um, conceptual power as the mm -hmm. of uh, idea of, of, of you know, yeah. things uh, moving. Scale to scale, yeah. Way. So I wonder whether you thought about that in relation to the active turbulence, because it's never been clear to me whether that's a, something like that is going on or not in active turbulence. So what we, okay, so the short answer is that for beyond the critical transition, we are able to, within the closure approximation, uh, where am I? We are able to look at essentially the flux, which is there is a it's a tiny little flux, but there is a flux, and and so, so sort of that's in the closure, and this is from the numeric. So you see, it's so it's not a huge. Oh, sorry, much yeah, more like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Picture exactly, the and and hence you know at at some intuition, it's sort of probably not that surprising that you have a minus three else. Yes, yes, indeed. So that's the flux. So it is set. So there's a comment on the on the, yeah. the second part. Yeah. So. Um, when the f of alpha came along, which was, I guess, was, was um, Thomas Halsey and Leo Kavanaugh, there, there, there was a, 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 a picture about what multifractality might mean, 
which is kind of embedded in the way they talk about F of alpha, which is that you've got these this kind of uh, it's like you know um, a lavish forest of different singularities interwoven, yeah. and each singular, each each strength of singularity has its own fractal dimension. Yeah, and then uh, you could imagine sort of overlaying these yeah. fractals, and you get something which then when you take the different moments, you see different fractals. You pick out the so different one view of math. Not mm -hmm. one but there's another one which is more like um, you start with some kind of uh, more or slightly more geometric picture where you have some density, some measure, and it's in blobs. And in each blob, you sort of zoom in and you decorate, you subdivide this measure into uh, multiple. Well, it's basically a kind of uh, spatially distributed multiplicative uh, uh -huh. random process. And something that, um, you know, paper long forgotten even by me, um, although I wrote it. That second view gives you a distinctly different uh, character for the spatial correlations. You start looking at correlations oh, at the moments. So you take the third moment here and the fifth moment there, and you look at the, the, the dependence on the separation. There is a-, a So can you just repeat what you said? So you, you take- You can define correlation yes. for any pair of powers yes. of you. Yeah, uh, u to the n at x, u to the n at x plus y, and as a function of y, mm -hmm. that has some scaling with the separation that involves both of those indices. And um, so, uh, and I mean, at the time it just seemed like a curiosity, but now there's so much more data on, particularly on proper turbulence, that I wonder if it might not be possible to maybe look at some of these correlation frames. Because it's, it's not quite what, what you're saying is that there are you should think of a, a sort of composite picture of mm. not quite as a picture of God, and then um, patches. Strong patches, yeah. But it may be that if you took this second view of multi fractal, then you find then it would be like that anyway, and that there would be sort of big lacunae where there isn't any anything interesting going on. I'm not sure. Uh, this, this I need to think, yeah, but, but maybe I'll write you and you can send me this, yeah, perfect. Thanks. Any more? Okay, well, thanks for meeting again. Thanks. thanks.